Let's see. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Brian Walsh. I uh, currently work for the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery that's housed at the World Bank. And um, even inside the World Bank, we've got extra money because that's a trust fund, and we try to mainstream uh, disaster risk management best practices both inside the bank and in, uh, in client governments um, all around the world, wherever we work. Uh, until recently, I was working at IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna, where I was working with, um, with integrated assessment models and, uh, and with uh, systems dynamics models. And before that, I was doing my PhD in particle physics. So I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different types of models in a lot of different contexts. And uh, on the basis of that, I'm gonna sort of take a step back and not present a, any sort of specific model or, or talk about things, but really talk about modeling in context and hopefully pick up um, some of the threads that I, I heard in, in the talks this morning with Jonathan and Mora and, uh, and also sort of maybe take a step back and I'll t try to take the economist role in a room full of uh, natural scientists maybe. And so uh, I wanna start with a thought experiment. So imagine you're a World Bank analyst and there are two projects that come across your desk. Uh, both of them are seawalls, both of them cost $100 million, and, but Project A um, will prevent on average $20 million of losses every year, and Project B will present, prevent on average $5 million of losses per year, and, you're, and you can fund only one. So the, um, so the challenge is to figure out which one, which one should we fund. And just to, I just wanna throw that out there and we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, you know, it's obvious, uh, both in general and also sort of in the context of just that last talk, that um, our capacity to model, predict, and indeed manipulate natural and social processes has never, is, has never been greater. Um, cheap computing power and new data streams are you know, sort of endlessly available. And uh, so more than ever, expertise is a scarce resource. Uh, but it's only a matter of time, arguably, until we're, we put ourselves out of business or we develop the machines that will do so. And if our uh, friend at NOAA is too clever, then he will do so, he'll put himself out of a job uh, more quickly than the Trump administration wants to. But, um, you know, so the question that we need to ask, and I think it's really useful in this context, in the context of a, a sort of linking up uh, social and, and physical models, is, you know, what is the value that's added by modelers uh, when, what is the value that we add now, and what is the value that we will still add when our stochastic agent-based models are just self-generated, when sort of the machines can train themselves to do all this kind of thing. Um, and to think about that, I, uh, as I said, I've worked with a lot of different models in a lot of different contexts, and so I wanna think about what is a model, and you know, economist's not a philosopher, so it's not too deep, but uh, a model, I'll just throw out there, is a fixed framework of observations, corollaries, best guesses, narratives, and indeed biases. Um, even if you're granting good science, and we've talked, obviously, uh, confirmation bias is always sort of, is always guarded against, but even if you grant good science, uh, bias can be found in the boundaries and the boundary conditions of almost every model. Um, specifically, uh, what kind of processes and interactions are included versus excluded from your domain, uh, and in what detail. Um, the scope, so to put it another way, I think the scope and the depth of, of models are themselves functions of the questions that we ask, the way that we phrase them, and of our expectations uh, as regarding like, what the answer should look like. And in that sense, I think machines are gonna do a lot better than we will They'll eliminate that, that bias, um, you know, in the 10 years or so. Um, but then, you know, if you step back and say, what, is, what are models good for? Because we spin a lot of them all the time and we pour over them and um, they break our hearts. But, you know, what, what is their use? Uh, even if your model represents the processes and makes predictions with accuracy, maybe they're falsifiable, maybe they're never falsified, maybe you're great. Utility is ultimately gonna be determined by your audience. Um, and I never sort of internalize that more strongly than, at the, than during my time at the bank. Um, and so again, to put that another way, the information about an ecosystem or any given process is really only for curiosity's sake, especially in the fields here represented, if we collectively don't sort of value the subject. You know, um, if you don't, if, if, if the market or, or whatever other determiner of value there is, doesn't decide that your ecosystem is worth saving, then it's like your interest is not really relevant. And so um, the claim here is that as we build and communicate our models, we have to be aware of the values that we're communicating, the values that, that our models are uh, uh, built upon, 
and we have to know when to stop the facts from getting in the way of a true story um, to, to sort of alter Mark Twain's quote a little bit. Uh, so to make this a little bit more uh, concrete in, in my job now, uh, I do disaster risk management in developing countries and uh, specifically right now, the project we're working on is quantifying resilience to natural disasters uh, throughout the Philippines. And so, you know, I mean, resilience is a, is a buzzword. And so we define it in this case as uh, the ratio of asset losses to well-being losses after a shock. Um, if, you, if anyone's familiar with traditional risk assessments, or even if not, usually you, you look at the hazards or the um, just you know the frequency of hurricanes or earthquakes or whatever you want or whatever you can. You look at the exposure, the location of, of assets, and then vulnerability. And this, of course, goes back to the, uh, the, the quote Jonathan had up that uh, floods are an act of God before losses are an act of man. Um, so you know, in, in our analysis, our, our group at the bank, we're trying to look not, not only stop there at a traditional assessment, but look at who's affected and to quantify their capacity to cope with and uh, hopefully recover from a shock. Uh, so now I'm just going to, I'm not going to go deeply into this model. It's relatively simple. Um, so we, but we incorporate data on hazards, asset type, and vulnerability. Again, that's the uh, traditional analysis, the first three bubbles on the left. But then you push further into looking at poverty incidents, financial inclusion, social safety nets, um, income distribution, insurance and remittances, all the things that actually sort of determine whether a person is able to, for example, dip into savings to cover a loss in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. And in that way, we try to translate asset losses into well-being losses. Um, and with that, we're able to, we're able to generate, you know, pretty maps. And uh, you can see on the left, you see asset losses. So that's a traditional analysis. And you can see that the Northeast Ridge of the Philippines gets the brunt of both uh, the Pacific hurricane season, but also um, that's, those, that's the edge that lies right on the ring of fire. And so they, they sort of get it all. Uh, on the right, you can see socioeconomic capacity or resilience. Now that is our estimate of, that's, that's our model's uh, uh, determination of how people, when they, when they face a loss, are able to cope with it. And so you can see that uh, actually, obviously, uh, Manila is in this dark green region, sort of at the, at the bottom of the Northern Island. island. And then uh, sort of it, as you get more rural and as you get further south, you get more rural and more impoverished. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, you, you get a different lens um, than just a normal analysis where you would want to build, you know, higher dams and dikes and uh, more earthquake resilient infrastructure. But here you see that actually it's, soft instruments like social protection and things like that can, can uh, actually make a difference. Um, and so to start to put numbers on this, what we, we look at, you can see starting from the left, I mean, these are, th this is the population of the Philippines broken down into income uh, quintiles. And you can see that the, as you'd expect, the, the bottom 10% of the, pop or excuse me, the bottom quintile of the population has the lowest, has the fewest assets. Um, but when they are, when a disaster comes through, they, uh, they lose a larger fraction of their assets they, that affects their consumption more greatly. And ultimately, as, as a fraction of their total consumption. And, and when we look at welfare, well-being, then what you see is that a much smaller, uh, a much smaller absolute, loss in absolute terms um, for poor people actually generates a much greater uh, hit to their well-being. And so what we're saying is that even though, or precisely because they have the least to lose, the poor, the global poor, are more affected by and take longer to recover from shocks. Uh, and so, you know, again, we can put numbers to this. We can we sort of show up in Manila and try to argue on behalf of this, that they should use our model. And um, it can be used in several ways. You can look at the benefits of national disaster, disaster risk management policies. And that might be the traditional analysis. You can look at the placement of assets, you can look at how to reinforce them, you can look at you know, when, when a disaster comes through, how do you build back better? Um, and so you know, that's, again, a traditional analysis. You can also target resources and assess the benefits of social and financial inclusion, um, early warning systems, for example. Uh, and that can be at the provincial level. So it's not just sort of like somebody, the problem of somebody above you, but indeed, at every government level, you can engage, engage stakeholders. Um, and you can also use the tool to assess the, both the immediate and the long-term impacts of 
a specific project on resilience, for example, social safety nets or, or uh, whatever it is you want. And so this brings us back to the uh, project. So again, project A and B, they cost the same, but project A prevents $20 million a year and project B costs $5 million a year. And a traditional cost benefit analysis will stop right there and say, you should always fund project A. Um, but in our analysis, you can imagine that you, you can sort of pull back the curtain and find that the $20 million of losses or, or project A is protecting a central business district and project B is protecting a, actually a slum from flooding. And so the $20 million might be a, a handful of, of buildings um, in the central business district, but the $5 million are gonna be the aggregate losses of uh, hundreds of thousands of, if, you know, up to millions of people, each losing maybe $5. Uh, but you know, as we've seen, that, that can have a major impact on their well-being. Um, and the argument here is not that you, that B should be, chosen over A in all cases, but rather that B should in some, should sometimes be given a chance to succeed, to be the project that's chosen. Um, and to come back to the original framework, that is a values judgment. And that is sort of driving our model. Um, and that's the conversation we have when we show up in Manila. So uh, to what I, I claimed the explicit goal of this model is to quantify resilience to natural disasters in the Philippines. But it's also given that the mandate of the bank uh, in general is to reduce poverty. So you know, we have a, a more or less implicit agenda, which is to show up and make the case both inside the bank and uh, in client governments that the assets of the poor, urban slums, subsistence farming, um, and related infrastructures are at least as worthy of protection from hazards as the central business districts and other major infrastructures. And that is, a contentious claim in both inside the, the bank and out. Um, and it, does, it's some, it helps a bit that we've got a fancy model to make that case, but it uh, ultimately comes down to, to value judgments. Um, and we can acknowledge that our, our value judgment, that, that the poor need to be protected, is based on a partial picture. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more going on. And as I said, it's not a, it's not a given when you show up in Manila. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. So in order of deepening cynicism, um, the model is going to seem like a trick if your interlocutor isn't sympathetic to the premise that you have to worry about poor people in disaster planning. Uh, and in that case, more complexity is a clear negative. And so when I, when I went to Manila, I actually had an undersecretary of development say, reject our argument by saying that the uh, sort of middle-class people and wealthy uh, suburbs of, of Manila are more attached to their lifestyle than the rural farmers are to theirs. <laughs> and therefore, the downsides for the, for the um, middle class are much greater, and therefore, they need to be protected. Uh, the assets need to be directed to them. And so uh, that sort of leads to the second point that our model doesn't consider the constituencies or varying prerogatives of uh, various bureaucrats and the sort of political promises their bosses have made. But then, of course, you know, the moral hazards of, the, um, of international development are pretty well known. And so at the moment, the, the poor are the liability of the international community from the perspective of Manila, maybe. You know? And there, maybe even if we agree that the goal is to get them to be self-sufficient, they might say, it's not the time. We need to worry about our uh, value-producing assets or the things that really drive our economy, and it, and it may not be. The poor, and so the government can reasonably reject our values and therefore our premises, and sort of go on with disaster risk management however they want. And uh, less, I'm not going to let you think that that is just what happens in uh, international development, because at I would argue that at Globium, uh, for at least speaking of uh, a lot of integrated assessment models, it's also the case that that these uh, the uses are driven by by the values that sort of um, underlie them. So uh, if you're not familiar with Globium, that is an integrated assessment model of competition for land. So it uh, has representations of agriculture, livestock, bioenergy, forestry, and then trade. And uh, it sort of operates on 10-year time scale. And it's a syncretic model. Um, it's sort of, it's, I mean, I'd say it's deliberately evolved, but it's, it still is continuing to evolve. And it's, it's uh, the product of several models stitched together. So Probably people are familiar with Epic, G4M, Ruminant, and others. Um, 
and then and it has a very strong constituency. Uh, Globium is a principal contributor of scenarios and analytics to a lot of European Commission projects, including uh, it's a major contributor to the Red Pack program, cash transfers for um, to prevent deforestation, Impact Two, GHG Europe, and and the AgMet program. Uh, and despite its success, they're sort of slowly, maybe begrudgingly, moving toward a stochastic model. And I, I think it's un, that's understandable, despite the fact that a stochastic model would be better than a deterministic one for all that it covers. Um, and Glovium has been successful, uh, again, without disparaging my colleagues at EASA, it's been very successful despite a couple of uh, major flaws. So uh, Glovium, like a lot of integrated assessment models, maintains uh, closely held secrets. And in this case, uh, for these land use models, the big thing is the is rebalancing Chinese production and consumption of agricultural goods. Uh, it's sort of nonsense when it comes out of FAO stats, so they spend a lot of time to figure that out, and they don't want anybody else to know how they did it. And that's true for every group that's try, tried to do it, as far as I know. And so they protect their market share by discouraging competition in that way. It's not an open source model, and uh, I think it's it's reasonable, at least for now, to, to maintain that position. Um, it's a black box also. So for this, again, for the same reasons as the trade secrets, there's not much way in the way of error analysis, but still uh, it's very easy to publish with this model, be relatively speaking, uh, relative to sort of trying to get stand up another one, even if that one is in a total glass box. Uh, and it's easy to publish it outside its intended use. So we, uh, looked, we ran an analysis looking at sort of trade-offs and co-benefits within the SDGs. And uh, that was sort of far beyond anything that it had been used for before. And Science Advances didn't really blink. So um, there's, there's a real bias toward this. And you know, if you think about why integrated assessment models are so seductive, uh, you know, I, think, I think the answer lies in the fact that they still trade in scenarios, and those make for easy narratives. Um, each of those scenarios is, is more or less agnostic about its probability of obtaining. So if you run for long enough, everybody gets a scenario that they're happy with. And uh, you know, they can be particularly effect effective at driving policy when there's a consensus on value. So for example, if you are, it's, it's a good job if you can get it working for the Norwegian government because um, you know, they have a very clear sense, they've combined a clear sense of values with a massive sovereign wealth fund. And uh, so you get the Red Pack program where it cash transfers to, uh, to governments in, in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, and in Indonesia to try and prevent deforestation. And the uh, problem, so it's very easy to, to sort of leverage money and get out there and spend the money. But the problem, of course, with these models, with Globium in particular, comes they achieved great success in, um, in Brazil under the Red Pack program, in part because the government was committed to uh, cooperating to solving the problem of deforestation, and, and they, they succeeded in doing so. It was an epic failure in Indonesia, and that's because they, the model didn't incorporate the fact that you're dealing with a, a, a decentralized, a weak central government and decentralized interests in each of the provinces. And the claim here is that's uh, not just like, you, don't, you can't just throw up your hands, that is actually a failure of the model to incorporate something like that. And so in that context, the stochastic model is probably going to be an improvement. You're, if you've got a dedicated clientele, they might keep going along on this journey with you. But otherwise, actually, a stochastic model is going to dilute your narrative. It's going to uh, make less clear the values that underlie your, your, um, your scenarios. And, it, and you can end up with a confusing or substance-free uh, world. And I will, modeling world, and I'll let you decide which fate is worse. I, I don't know. So to start to wrap up, um, I want to argue that the values and the priorities of any individual model may be more or less explicit, but they're absolutely always there. Um, and so even after we surrender complete policy control to the computers, we're going to need modelers uh, to advocate for those, for those values that we're now sort of espousing more or less uh, explicitly. Um, and those include the welfare of the global poor, ecosystems that are fragile and increasingly disappearing, and also human well-being broadly construed. Uh, but until we do surrender that policy control, the emotional content of our models is going to motivate action much more effectively than facts, figures, and you know, fancy diagrams. And so um, I'll just end with a, 
like to put a really fine point on it, I would say that within the fields represented here, given the stakes of uh, failing to adapt over the next, not 50 years, but 10 to 20, there's a moral obligation to actually consider and to advocate ever more effectively for the values that do underpin our work. Again, whether that's sort of um, disenfranchised or poor communities or ecosystems that are disappearing, but are, you know, but no one realizes how essential they are, except for maybe a very small group of people. Um, and in doing so, I, I would argue that it will always make us able to, better able to structure and sort of package our models in a way that maximizes the real contribution to the SDGs, the Convention of Biodiversity, Paris, or whatever it is that, uh, whatever it is that challenge us to be today. So, thank you, that's all. Imagine that generated a fair amount of questions. So um, we have time for a member. Yes, uh, Leho. Thanks, Brian. That um, that was a really fascinating talk. Um, and and I I agree with you. And I, I'd like to ask you know if if is something that we as modelers need perhaps. Um, is to have maybe even, you know, frameworks in the praxis of modeling that allow us to um, better explicate what those values are a priori to sort of running our models and designing our numerical experiments. And would that be a vehicle both to sort of accomplish what you're suggesting, which is that we just need to be more, um, to, to A, sort of, you know, be more explicit about what those values are, um, and how they're informing our model, but also help us to sort of better interpret the results and be able to communicate them to the particular audiences. And, and do you have any ideas like what that framework for explicating those values might be? Yeah, I mean, I um, I think that the, the the preliminary step is actually acknowledging that 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 framework exists, that those those values exist. I mean, it's really easy. It's really tempting, I should say, to sort of take your model out of out, out of its data set, you know, to sort of to add little modules or little gadgets. And someone comes with you, comes to you with a problem, and you say, "Oh, yeah, we can we spend a little time. We can expand into that." And then, and you don't really consider the ways in which the model was constructed and how its functioning reflects those uh, those ends when you sort of jump into a new when you jump into a new sphere. It's easy to be glib about that. And at the same time, actually, it's easy, I'll speak for myself, not for the room, but it's easy to be a bully when you show up with a model and it's like, and it makes results that make people happy or not or whatever, but still, like, if you're the, if you're in a lot of policy rooms, especially when I was at IASA, but also now, most people don't have a model. So if you do, then you get to, you get to sort of drive the conversation, right? And uh, I think that we have to be a lot, I think we just need to be more honest about what what went into that, what is it good for and what is it not good for, right? Um, so yeah, and, and I mean the values project is, is embedded in that, I would say. So I know Michael and Peter and Hugo, and I've worked closely with them, and I've also done a lot of this modeling using the impact model instead of Globiome, although I was also in charge of a model and a comparison method that was looked at results from the, these various models that do the same sort of thing that Globiome does. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I, so, so, you know, one of the reasons we model is because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And if you're not surprised by the outcome, then probably you're not doing something right. Um, and I think that that's an important outcome that you've probably passed over, that you, you should be coming to policymakers with results that are perhaps surprising to them. And you should be able to back those up with some kind of a, of a uh, you know, s s science that tells you why you came to that position. And there is always going to be some value in, in the process by which you got there. But I don't think anybody that does this kind of modeling builds the values in per se. Um, I, I would also say that the, uh, the, one of the reasons why Globium is so successful is not the model, but the presenters. And so Michael is a, this is the person who is the, the father at least, or the godfather of 
of Globiome, um, is extremely good at presenting concepts to people who are, you know, really not interested in the details of the models. And so you have to ask the question, you know, so what are his biases, I guess? Um, and the last thing I would say is that funders are responsible for this. You know, a lot of people write checks to, to Yasev to use Gobiam or to IFPRI for impact without making the next step, which is to say, you have to tell us how you get your results, what your data are used, what data you use, look, show us your code. Having said that, Gobiam, if impacted, if pre, uh, at least are, are moving in the direction of open sourcing their code. And we have a project that with Globiome is that might get funded that would move that process further along. And some of the larger in, uh, integrated assessment models in the context that the people in the room probably know, the, the, the uh, GCAM or those folks have been forced by their funders to do this. And so I think, you know, you're, you were a little bit more pessimistic about the situation of the field than I think perhaps is warranted, but I, it's useful to make these points over and over again, I have to say. So I, I would just say, I mean, I absolutely agree with the point. Anybody who's met Michael Obersteiner knows that that whole program is driven by the force of his personality, as well as the, uh, I mean, a, a great deal of its successes, I should say. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm pessimistic, rather actually that something will be lost when Globiome goes to, uh, something of its success, uh, some key ingredient, Will be lost when it goes when it's a fully stochastic model because in large part it's you can't you can't assume that the model is going to continue forever successfully because Michael Obersteiner is there uh, and and in fact it presents easy to digest narratives which by and large you know it, I didn't sort of weigh in on whether they're right or not and of course they're actually it's successful because it because they do good work and it's it's the best that we got but it's the best that we have collectively but it's not. I don't think that'll be the case for long. And I think the fact that it's still closed source, uh, in some ways it protects what they've got and there's good reason to do that, not just sort of selfish or um, financial reasons. Uh, but I'm, I, so I would say I'm, conversely, something will be lost when it goes to a stochastic model. That's in, there's a risk of letting the facts get in the way of the truth there. On? Okay. Um, yeah, great talk. I'm just wondering, uh, as a modeler, you're also in control in what type of output metrics you provide to the uh, policymakers. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in your example, if you say uh, the same 100 million, either you say, uh, what was it, 20 million or 5 million, and then you, after the fact, need to explain, but the one saves more lives, what if your output metric, you say that was a this scenario saves 20 lives, this scenario saves 5,000 lives, or affects 20 lives, affects 5,000 lives. Then you kind of turn it around, and it's up to them to then admit, like, well, are those five, what is the income of those 5,000 mm -hmm. lives? And then it's actually a, a direct answer uh, that maybe B might be the better uh, uh, choice. So are you, do you have that uh, flexibility to choose your output metric? Or? Um, the first answer is uh, no, because I'm only invited into the room if I give the answer that the loan officer wants, right? Like, so we part of the reason that the GFDR um, has its own pot of money is because I don't have to go and bill some other team at the bank if I am working on somebody else's project, right? And so we like we show up, and we say we're free, and we can maybe help you be a little bit more rigorous on resilience or disaster risk management generally, so maybe you should consider us, but if we're gonna get in the way of them making a loan, no, you're, you're out. Uh, and you know, the other thing is, the people are just used to disaster, disaster losses are you know, sort of expressed in tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, they're, or as a fraction of GDP, and that's what people are looking for. And so you, you couldn't really lead with a, a number you can't it's it's difficult to leave with a number that they're not familiar with because then you're already out of context for a lot of people and you might they might be like oh you know this is not what i was looking for so this is pretty silly yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of that going on so it's 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 a big part of message control yeah mm -hmm. and in this case to be clear i mean people so we we can try to quantify how many people will 
fall into or come out of um, extreme poverty. But of course, like the model is desperately trying to avoid putting a value on lost life, right? So this, so that's a, so that's not an argument that we're trying to get into. Thanks. So our next speaker is Robert Nichols, good friend of mine, on talking about a favorite topic of mine. Somewhere like...